What I want to do in, the, in these comments, it'll connect to the comments that have been made before by Jeff and Michael, but I want to more specifically focus on Craig's paper and raise a few questions about this fascinating and important paper and the larger body of writings in which it's embedded, which I've had a chance to read and to some extent reread in a reading group that was organized by Lee Schlesinger during the weeks leading up to this, um, including The Roots of Radicalism and especially the chapter that I mentioned in my comment before the break called The Public Sphere in the Field of Power that also appeared in the journal Social Science History. I want to try to relate what Craig is doing here to the writings of, th of two writers he talks about and one that he sort of may be alluding to but doesn't mention by name. This is Pierre Bourdieu, Axel Honneth, and, and Dewey himself. First point is that in the public sphere in the field of power, and to some extent in his Tanner lecture yesterday, Craig is rereading Habermas's category of the public sphere through Bourdieu's field theory and his more general social theory. Like Bourdieuian fields, the public sphere was construed, at least by Habermas, as a bounded sphere. And Craig showed us the image of, the, of Escher in the sphere perhaps not bounded geographically, but at least bounded sociologically or socially in terms of exclusions and inclusions, preconditions for entrance. In Bourdieu's case, general communicative competence takes the form, if we translate that into Bourdieuian language, of a kind of a habitus that's adjusted to the specific game of the field, adherence to a, co a common field illusio or belief in the, f in the value of the game for its, on its own terms, a libidinal investment using a language that Bourdieu constantly uses indicating the deep psychic in uh, investment in, in social games, in the worthiness of the stakes for which the game is being played, a shared sense of the field's history, and the location of different positions and different actors and different groups within it, etc. Craig quite specifically connects the public sphere to Bourdieu's concept of the field of power, or locates it within the field of power, to be more precise. Um, and this is, of course, in Bourdieu's language, the field of power is kind of a, a meta field within which all of the other fields are, are more or less located, a kind of a Bourdieuian translation of C. Wright Mills's notion of the power elite. This is fascinating, I think, but it raises for me a number of questions that I'd like to try to get into, if only briefly. First, um, Bourdieu also distinguished between the state and its specific bureaucratic or administrative field, and he calls this the field, the administrative field or the bureaucratic field in his fourth, well, his lectures that have now been published, his Collège de France lectures on the state, which are coming out in English this year. The book is called On the State. He distinguishes between the state field in that sense and the field of politics. And he has a short book published by the University Press of Lyon where he explicitly developed his theory of the field of politics and a number of other essays. Habermas's political public sphere would seem to be located in the latter, in the field of politics, but I'm not sure, perhaps also in the field of the state. And this is complicated if we then reread Habermas through Dewey the way that Craig did in his lecture yesterday. Because in the book that Craig's title was based on by John Dewey, The Public and Its po Problems, the public is first defined as equivalent to the state. And as the book goes on, the public becomes something that leads into a state, a democratic state. Um, and so these categories, I think, are incredibly important, especially if we go to the sorts of questions that Jeff was raising at the very end in his discussion of the ways different social movements do or do not have the project of eventually becoming um, political parties or parties that want to transform the field of power in the state itself. Habermas's political public sphere, and we distinguish already between the political public sphere, say, and the literary public sphere, or the public spheres that lead into the formation of a political public sphere, would seem to be located in the field of politics, but I'm not sure. One thing Bourdieu says about the political field in advanced capitalist societies and in democratic, soci democratic states is that it differs from other fields specifically in terms of its openness. This is a theme that he develops in the, in the lectures that he gave at the University of Lyon. It's low degree of autonomy. It's relative lack of closure. This is obviously just another translation of the fact that in these societies, all adult citizens are allowed to participate at the very limit, at least, by voting. That makes this a more permeable sort of a field than the field of, say, 
analytics philosophy or even sociology, which is not open to all. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, you do have to at least nowadays have a PhD in sociology. At a slightly more demanding level, there are political parties, and political parties are key actors in the political field too, but here again, barriers to entry are relatively low, although we do have, as Max Weber pointed out, in some countries and sometimes in places, something like politics as a vocation, professionalization of political parties. We in the United States know that that's a, that doesn't fit very well our, our structure of political parties these days. Anyone can at least, at least join, at least if they're recognized by the ones who are already inside. Then there are the party elites, and we could go on. These groups circulate between the political field and the state field, again, using the language of Bourdieu. They're in the political field, especially when they're out of power. They're in the state field, perhaps, when they're in power. But there is a relative independence of the political field from the state field in this language. Bourdieuian social movement scholars, then, point to yet a third political actor or category. People like the Michigan PhD student Hiroe Saruya in her recent PhD dissertation on the 1960 ANPO pro protests in Tokyo, or the French scholar, the political scientist and sociologist Lilian, Lilian Mathieu in her article that, called The Space of Social Movements, which appeared in the journal Politiques, have argued that social movements are too loosely related to one another, with too few barriers to entry into that space or that arena of, of social movements to qualify them as a field properly, properly put. There's no specific form of symbolic capital, for example, that defines all of the actors in that field. So they don't seem to qualify as a field in Bourdieu's sense. This is relevant to Craig's project, I think, in ways that maybe will become more evident in the course of a discussion that might follow in his writings and in his response yesterday to a question. Craig insisted that he wants to break down the dichotomy between proper politics and politics more broadly on the one hand and social movements or counterpublics on the other. And we got into this in the discussion of Warner's paper, Michael Warner's paper today. On the other, uh, returning to Craig's use of Bourdieu's concepts here, I wonder whether counterpublics should be considered part of the public sphere and therefore part of the field of power or the field of politics? Do they belong to a separate subfield within the field of politics? Or do they belong to an entirely separate field? Is there a sort of a policing of counterpublic within counterpublics of one another as to whether they have genuine counterness? I think all of us who've been inside of various counterpublics know that this seems to exist, right? So this seems to have a kind of a fieldness to it. The counterfields are fields nonetheless, in, in, in at least some of them proper, perhaps. Um, a related question also based on Bourdieu is whether all fields are, in fact, public or part of the arena of publicness. On the, on the one hand, to exist, a field needs to have multiple positions within it, multiple actors displaying practices or acts to one another, this idea of display that I was mentioning before and after your talk, allowing reciprocal evaluation of practices, assessment of those practices' value in terms of a highly arbitrary but nonetheless highly structurally present field-specific symbolic capital and array of practices on that, on, that high, on, that, uh, on that scale. This, it seems, would require at least a low level of publicness, of observability, of inspectability, perhaps. On the other hand, esoteric, scientific, and academic disciplines on the one hand are certainly fields, they're sort of paradigmatic fields in that sense, but their borders are carefully policed against outsiders. The activity that goes on is extremely difficult to decipher by outsiders, and so on. An even less public seeming field is the economy itself. Bourdieu analyzed real estate as a field. The modern era, quote unquote, may not in all respects entail an expansion of publicness, but rather an expansion of fieldness. The creation of what Craig, in his essay on Bourdieu in the recent book, Bourdieu and the Historical Analysis, edited by Phil Gorski, this, and which just came out with Duke, calls the creation, and I love this term, of a fielded society, the idea of a society with a proliferation of fields, in which fields, in fact, are one of the key structures, or the key structure, of that modern society. A final question raised by Bourdieu and amplified, perhaps, by Chantal Mouffe in her work on, and on agonistic politics is the question of whether Calhoun's version of publicness is agonistic. 
Bourdieu, and I heard you talking to some graduate students about this after your talk last night, but I don't think the public here heard that, so it would be interesting maybe to reveal your response to that. Bourdieuian fields are agonistic sites. So Bourdieu is clearly an agonistic theorist in Chantal Mouffe's terms of intense disagreement and heterogeneity within fields. Fields cannot exist without diversity and heterogeneity and difference. In fact, fields would require the production of such. This would be a field effect, even if everyone were alike, when the field, if a field could be created magically by the social god, that social god would create a field and everyone within the field would immediately discover microscopic differences that they would amplify into larger differences. That's, I think, part of what, what Bourdieu is pointing toward, this agonistic nature of the field. But on the other hand, they're also characterized by these deeper perhaps even deeper concerns captured by the concepts of illusio and libidinal investment in which all the actors agree that this is a game worth playing. If they didn't agree on that, they wouldn't be in the game. And so agonism is combined nicely with, with a kind of a deeper level consensus. Craig seems to have so completely rejected Habermas's original formulations as to no longer require any sort of consensus or at least his version of publicness it seemed to me, at least, and this is really reading implications into it that he didn't explicitly state, but it seemed to me that the kind of, he was twisting the stick, at least in the other direction, away from Habermas's requirement that fields through their rational uh, procedures would produce some sort of consensus. So that's my first set of comments all had to do with sort of this, these questions of field theory and Bourdieu meeting Habermas. A second set of questions is related to, to, the, to, to the, a different thinker, Dewey, and in particular to the reading that Axel Honneth has produced, which I think differs in some interesting ways, perhaps, from Craig's reading. Um, both of them are using it as a critique of Habermas. In his essay, Democracy is Reflexive Cooperation, which appeared in the journal Political Theory in 1998, Axel Honneth argues or draws on Dewey and on the same book that Craig drew on to argue that a democratic public sphere has to be grounded in a democratic, just, cooperative division of labor. And he uses the word division of labor repeatedly and explicitly. Uh, another synonym for that would be the economy, the realm of production, the social realm. These are used more or less interchangeably. Hunnett is not as Nancy Fraser has pointed out, a highly sophisticated theorist of capitalist economics and re modes of production. That's her critique of Honneth. But at the same time, he's really shifted the emphasis toward the social um, realm of what he calls the division of labor as the basis. And I think this overlaps in some ways with what Jeff was saying in his comments on, in his critique of Habermas. Honneth uh, draws on Dewey to argue this. Indeed, the so-called division of labor, and I'll keep using his term as a shorthand for all of those other economic and social relations, um, this division of labor is for Hunnett, and he claims for Dewey, where democratic publicness emerges. It's prefigured there. And Hunnett reminds us of Dewey's origins as a Hegelian and the fact that, and points to the resonances of this language with Marx, with the early Karl Marx, and the idea of, a, of a, a system of free cooperative laborers as being the basis for a communist society and basically a, a form of self-government. Um, indeed, this is where democratic public, publicness then emerges. The collective cooperative social economy is the realm of practice upon which political publicness is founded, even if the political democratic public sphere also, and this is what Karl Marx left out according to Honneth, um, requires very specific institutions, irreducibly political institutions that cannot be collapsed into or derived from the economy. Crucially for Axel Honneth, this social cooperation is not explicitly and exclusively discursive. I think this is another point that we might want to discuss. Some of Craig's comments seem to um, move back toward Habermas with his exclusively or explicitly communicative or discursive definition of publicness even if it's centered on rational collective problem solving. The idea that expanded political democracy is prefigured by social cooperation sets a, sets a slightly different accent, I think. Um, as Honneth 
concludes Dewey's theory of democracy opens a third avenue between the false options of an over-ethicized republicanism, and he defines that as a theory of politics that requires citizens to always already be virtuous before entering into, the pol into politics, and also from the option of Habermas's, as he puts it, empty proceduralism. Namely, quote, to grasp democratic ethical life as the outcome of the experience that all members of a society could have if they related to one another cooperatively through a just organizing of the division of labor. Now, Nancy Fraser criticizes Honnett for his weak theorization of economic distribution relations, but Honnett and Fraser, Fraser both see the conditions of post-war Fordism, and I think you know, it's Nancy Fraser who brought this into the discussion, not Axel Hahn at first, as having partially realized or at least partially reduced inequalities for an expanded collectivity. Craig alluded to these conditions yesterday in some of his opening comments about corporations providing employee benefits during this period and the absence of that kind of corporate, corporate benevolence in the later period, the more recent period. The more cooperative collective social relations that were produced in that period provided a basis for an expansion of democratic publicness. This relative superiority of the conditions of the post-war decades and the coding of this period as relatively superior stands in a very interesting tension to Arendt's critique of mass society that Craig's paper deals with in the penultimate section. But even Honnett recognizes that, quote, we in the advanced, highly developed countries can already see the end of work society coming gradually, end quote. And this end of work poses problems for his own attempt to base political democracy in collective social behavior. Obviously, he recognizes that. This means that, and I want to read a somewhat long quotation from this paper, such an idea can no longer simply assume the form of a normatively inspired restructuring of the capitalist labor market. That, normative, that normatively inspired restructuring presumably was what social democracy was involved in during the post-war decades. Rather, one is to think of the project of a far-reaching radical redefinition of what in the future has to count as a cooperative con contribution to social reproduction in the sense that every adult member of society again gets the chance to participate in cooperation based on the division of labor. Now, he leaves it there, and I think some of Michael's comments can begin to tell us what that might look like and what that probably certainly doesn't look like. But, you know, he's not descending to that level of empirical specificity in this article, so we don't get much of a sense of it. From the perspective of this outcome, he continues, it is not difficult to, difficult to see why the democracy model of the mature Dewey can be considered a serious alternative in the, in the current debate because, to put it in a nutshell, this model requires the normative idea of democracy not only as a political but first and foremost as a social ideal." End quote. Honnett, Honnett argues that what makes Dewey radical is the idea of a society, that a society is not just interaction or association, but, quote, perception of the consequences of a joint activity and of the distinctive share of each element in producing it, end quote. Dewey continues, quote, such perception creates a common interest, that is concern on the part of each in the joint action and in the contribution of each of its members to it. Then there exists something truly social and not merely associative, end quote. Dewey then gives a nice example of this quality of social emergence, writing that, quote, a molecule of oxygen in water may act in certain respects differently than it would in some other chemical union. But as a constituent of water, it acts as water does as long as water is water. So it's an example of social emergence, the concept of social emergence. This, this image suggests that Dewey does not see the public as just finding itself in discussion, but as finding itself in solidarity and in just social relations. Craig alludes to this argument at one point, writing in his paper that Nacht and Kluge, quote, in fact, echoed a theme from Dewey, who argued for, for common experience, including of production, as a source enabling popular democracy to escape reliance on experts. End quote. I wondered, though, whether he would go as far as critical theorists like Honnett in arguing for social production as the main ground of democracy. Now, one possibility that I would like to explore in the next part of my comments would be not just to reconstruct Habermas using Bourdieu, as I did in this first part, but to do this via Honnett's critique of Habermas. 
Here the point is that a democratic public sphere would have to be grounded in a democratic, just, cooperative economy, and that this social division of labor would be where democratic social publicness could be at least prefigured, if not where it would emerge from. If we extend this idea from Dewey and Hannett to Bourdieu, I think it becomes even more radical in its implications because Bourdieu has a critique not just of the maldistribution of the means of production and economic capital, but also of the distribution of cultural capital. This approach entails an even more thorough, thoroughgoing critique of, of existing society since it targets not just relations of production and recognition of, but also, re, it, excuse me, because it targets not relations of production exclusively, but also relations of the production and the recognition of legitimate cultural capital. This Bourdieusian supplement or reconstruction, I, I think would be a better word, need not entail a return to a purely discursive or communicative definition of publicness, since cultural capital is as much about material and bodily realities and relations as it is about discourse. Again, hook, hooking in with a, a theme in Michael's comments. What is at stake here is a social condition in which some practices are defined as being more distinguished than others. Bourdieu, like Nancy Fraser, urges us not to separate questions of recognition and redistribution and not to restrict either to narrowly economic relations or the division of labor. So I think this would move us beyond the early Honnet formulation. Let me return then to the social movements and counterpublics that Craig Calhoun has written about so extensively in Roots of Radicalism and in his other work. What I would suggest reading Calhoun through this version of Dewey is that counterpublics are the basis of publicness per se. Calhoun alludes to this argument, writing that, quote, public action helps to constitute the people of the people of potential democratic action, end quote. He urged us in his paper to, quote, be careful not simply to celebrate counterpublics, recognizing their existence and achievements, but forgetting that they have generally been contenders for more, more widespread influence, end quote. I submit that Calhoun could push, might be able to push this even farther, arguing that counterpublics are more than, quote, contenders for more widespread influence, end quote, but uh, in fact, the key instances of profound social cooperation in the present, perhaps the very foundation of democratic publicness in these transformed conditions that Honick only alludes to at the conclusion of an argument that one must admit is primarily backward looking by 1998. The formulation of oppositional interpretations of identities, interests, and needs by so-called subaltern counterpublics, to use a phrase from Nancy Fraser, is a precondition for democratic publicity itself. To the extent that these publics remain counterpublics and are not exiting from their counterpublicness, I, then there would be no Öffentlichkeit at all. I think this is the only. I think this is the problem with the Occupy movements. Um, refusal to, ultimate refusal to participate, at least insofar as they were able to continue a certain amount of time and then, and then more or less disappear. During that period, there was a kind of a refusal to participate in the democratic public sphere as the state or as the public political sphere as a point of principle. This refusal stems from a profoundly unequal social division of labor, so we can understand this as a, along similar lines to Hannah Arendt's diagnosis of the reason for the violence in the 1960s social movements as a kind of a almost pathological response to the violence of the society that people were living in while still condemning that violence. So we can understand this. The intense inequalities of the present leading to this impossibility of the transition from social, from the social division of labor into a political public sphere of the sort that is often connected to the word the state, um, or at least the political sphere proper, to use Craig's term from yesterday. We can understand that, but we don't necessarily have to endorse it. And I think the examples that Jeff gave in, his, in the closing parts of his comment did bring those kinds of movements together with ones that he, well, he mentioned the Communist Party and the Socialist Party, for example, in the post-war period. And so I'm, I guess I'm trying to draw a distinction between those. A third point that I'd like to close with concerns the question that Craig raised in his paper, the question he started with, which is the question of scale. Um, drawing on Dewey, he, he raises the problem for democracy of the massive scale of the United States, the mismatch between the great society and the great community, to use Dewey's terms. 
Now, as Nancy Fraser wrote in her co-authored debate with Honnett, the book Redistribution uh, and Recognition and Redistribution, I guess it's called, Fordism as a Mode of society, reg Societal Regulation uh, was, is a key element for understanding this post-war period in the three decades of growth after the war. Fordism saw massive policy efforts to eliminate inequalities of various sorts, even if it still remained a fully capitalist uh, mode of regulation. It eliminated spatial inequalities in a way that was palpable and of very significant, uh, great significance in countries that had a full-fledged Fordist mode of production. Neil Brenner's work on the Fordist spatial reorganization of West Germany from 1945 to 75 shows just how palpable this reduction of spatial inequality, for example, was. This is the kind of action by the state to rearrange the, quote, division of labor, which then makes, in, in Honnett's reading, would make possible a new burst of activity toward the creation of a democratic public sphere, possibly. This is the sort of reduction of inequality that we would need to call for in the present, obviously. But since the 1970s, by contrast, spatial inequalities have increased and new regions of economic growth have emerged that totally ignore national borders. A global state, today, which is another uh, idea that's raised briefly in Craig's paper, seems just as unlikely as a restoration of these strong national post-war Fortis states. But one thing I think that's interestingly different about the two periods is this coding of scale. The post-war period, for all of the good things it did, also involved this rescaling and this kind of rescaling of social practices into the scale of the nation state and the national the methodological nationalism that's frequently criticized as a symptom of post-war social scientific thinking, it was reproduced, was strengthened by the very practices of Fordism within the societies that social scientists were living. Since the 1970s, by contrast, at least this spatial imaginary has been exploded, and that could produce the possibilities for rethinking something at a scale higher than both the local, which is obviously inadequate, but also the national, which is clearly inadequate as well, given the fact that this so-called division of labor now exists at a more and more global scale. Without public re regulation at a global level, it's difficult to see how the conditions for, a new forms, for new forms of solidarity and collectivity could ever be sustained, even if we do have bursts of such solidarity as with the Occupy movement. A world state alone would be able to produce the social conditions I would submit for a global public sphere. My fourth and final comment is on the um, Craig's section in the paper, which he didn't spend much time on, uh, on Hannah Arendt and her analysis in the human condition. Um, since he didn't really say much about this, and I, in contrast to the others, wrote my comments before here in the paper, <laughs> in that brief window of opportunity. Um, I won't say much about this, but I agree with his uh, critique of Arendt's account of the rise of, the, of society. But in the paper, as it was presented yesterday, in the brief version of it, I think he still gives a little bit too much to Arendt. The reason the social is, quote, so refractory to public scrutiny and competition from multiple ways of ordering social relations doesn't lie in the ontological nature of the social or in the sheer existence of capitalism, but in the ways in which, the so in which society or the social is, in fact, not regulated. The opacity stems from the non-regulation of society. That is, in the fact that social relations have not been subjected to collective and democratic control. Social opacity may be the rule today for obvious reasons that we summarize under the headings like neoliberalism, and it was certainly the case at the end of the Weimar Republic, but this was and is due as much to the paralysis of the left and the mobilization of the far right as to any as to Arendt's, as to the, the, con the principles that Arendt points to, which is sort of capitalism and modern bureaucracy. Basically, Arendt seems to assume that a social democracy is impossible. She assumes that political democracy can arise without these cooperative social relations on the ground. So I think this provides us with the starkest contrast with the imagery from critical theory. This approach seems to me totally incompatible with Dewey and the public and its problems. At the very least, it seems to abdicate responsibility for a project of social as well as political democracy. And in closing, I just wanted to read the one passage from the Dewey book that I think makes this point the most dramatically, which is the, the pages where he 
turns to the phrases from the French Revolution, fraternity, fraternity, liberty, and equality, and argues that in the present, these three have become isolated from communal life as hopeless ab abstractions. But then he continues, and his book is, he claims to be doing an empirical analysis of what's actually happened, but in fact, it's a completely prescriptive philosophy of what should be, and here it becomes most clear. In its just, conne in its just connection with communal experience, fraternity is another name for the consciously appreciated goods which accrue from an association in which all share and which give direction to the conduct of each. Liberty is that secure release and fulfillment of personal potentialities which take place only in rich and manifold associations with others, so completely different from negative liberty, and the power to be an, the power to be an individualized self making a distinctive contribution and enjoying its own way with the fruits of association. Equality, finally, denotes the unhampered share with which each individual member of the community Excuse me. Equality denotes the unhampered share which each individual member of the community has in the consequences of associated action. So, um, yeah, if we take that, I think we can we can see the plausibility of of this uh, reading of of Dewey as a sort of a proto-critical theorist. Thank you. Uh, George, I was intrigued by the things you had to say about the Occupy movement. I, I agree with you entirely that um, that the Occupy movement didn't really have an adequate material basis for you know any kind of success, both because of who they were, unemployed people, deeply indebted students, and so forth, and because we really are, are currently living in. Uh, state formation that's much closer to plutocracy than it is real democracy. But I, but I think that that, to stress that, I think also fails to highlight the ways in which ideologically the Occupy movement was unable to self-organize mm -hmm. um, because they were very strongly influenced by anarchism <laughs> and consequently <laughs> It's not really, and so they, they weren't able to hammer out a common agenda because that was seen as imposing on the fellow members. But the thing is, if you just have a whole bunch of completely isolated people, each with their totally independent opinion, both of what's wrong and of what to do about it, you can't, it, it's really, it's a, that kind of anarchist individualism is deeply incompatible with any kind of serious democratic social movement? OK. Um, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess the only question you might ask, and this would be making claims for social human or social theory and science that it can never possibly reach, but what would explain the fact that at this moment in historical time, the anarchists of all tendencies were the ones that came to dominate that movement? You know, the, if that's actually an accurate description, and I've heard that myself and seem to observe that as well, why that tendency on the left as opposed to those who would see a, a possibility for articulating a social, the social division of labor with a political publicness oriented toward the state. Why, that that yeah. in and of itself is intriguing. I oh, think. I agree completely, but I think that's deeply linked to the severe decline of labor unions. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because they have traditionally been the voice yeah. of the working class, which is demolished in the financial crisis. So I agree with that too, and and that's why I wanted to make the comparison, even though it's a very different uh, situation to the uh, RN's analysis of the turn to violence by various tendencies, uh, kind of across movements. That's what's interesting about her analysis, even though it's highly objectionable in other ways. In the book on violence, in the late '60s, she attributes to this increasing violence within the social. Yours is another analysis that points to something in, the, in society at large leading to a very specific configuration of social movement strategies, practices, and the, and the balance of power within that sector of, or that field, if we want to use Craig's term, of social movements at that, at that moment. As I, yeah. got to go in two minutes. Okay, go, <laughs> quick. No, I I, I'd just like to hear you uh, um, talk a bit more about Arendt. Yeah. And the social. Uh, because, you know, in other ways, obviously, Arendt has become an extraordinarily important resource for lots of people thinking about these questions <clears throat> during the last uh, 
again, during the last qu quarter of a century. And I, I've been sort of, uh, you know, in, in the light of your own sort of uh, nascent critique, right, which I, I sort of shared in the past, I've been kind of slightly puzzled by the, the, the degree to which our end has become such um, a powerful resource for those of us who, you know, for many of us who are trying to think, not me yet, try, trying to think about these questions of um, the, the, the social supports for uh, democratic citizenship and so on, right? Mm -hmm. World making, you know, is another concept that comes to mind that hasn't really been hasn't really surfaced in, in the converse, conversation yet. So I'd just like to hear you um, develop, develop those. Well, what I was a bit more. criticizing was completely what Craig criticized when he showed the picture of the blob yesterday. It's the image of society based in mass society. And I think Craig might be able to respond better than that because I've only had 24 hours to think about this. But in terms of what I'm sympathetic to, it's some of the similar things that you've mentioned, the idea of the unprecedented and making space. There's a variety of different theoretical tendencies on the left and around, on the left, I guess you could say more specifically, that have tried to make, uh, tried to open up a space for not just contingency, contingency thinking, but for thinking about unprecedented events and breaking with the residual positivism of classical Marxism, for example, which expected general rules of social behavior. And in that sense, the notion of natality that Craig mentioned in his paper, the ideas of the, unex the unprecedented event have become attractive. I think the idea of particular, elaborating particular technologies for politics and instrumentalities and machines and not as in the, as in the early Marx, assuming a, uh, an immediate transition between social co cooperation and communism is, is also incredibly important, although Arendt is by no means the only one, you know, every, every political scientist in a sense should be or is involved in that, but she, she grants, or every, everyone who grants autonomy to the po political. So in, in, some of, in those and, and some other respects, I think she's become really, really, she is really useful, but this notion of the social, I don't know, Craig, what do you think? You put the picture of the yeah. blob up. <laughs> so the, the blob imagery is Hannah Pitkins, and, um, her and a finish pick in, in her book, The Attack of the Blob, which evokes this and I think gets something that is genuinely troubling about the way Arndt claims the social um, as a problem. Um, and what I wanted to say is that's all correct and it is a problem and yet she's on to something at the same time. So the, um, she's denouncing the egalitarianism um, of the rise of the social, but also the sort of everyday materialism of it, the preoccupation with what she calls housekeeping, which is not just the economy, but material life in its, the construction of ordinary life around a variety of material acquisitive ways. And the, in relation to George's talk about, is it unregulated or something? It, certainly not democratically organized the way George's trying to evoke, but I think she sees it as, um, and rightly, as partially, as, as monitored, if not regulated. Mm. Hence the emphasis on statistics and the extent to which there are all kinds of statistical mediations of this. And therefore, in addition to being monitored, it's produced. It is not simply, a, it's not a realm of freedom. It is a realm of consumption encouraged by you know, uh, corporate capitalism in ways that have been evoked before and all this and marketing and, and all of this. So that her point is this is what many people um, vest their hopes for freedom in and it's not freedom. And it is a very large scale structuring of lots of social life that is hard to resist and the uh, and it's particularly hard if many of the attempts at a resistance movement and I think she would couple not just Marxism but say human rights and things get caught up in it they fail to transcend and get outside of it um, now I agree with Pitkin that she sets it up in a way that makes it look as this external thing that happened hence the attack of the blob that this mass society somehow came and got us rather than having a real account of it from within. But what I think is useful that she points to um, here is the, that both public and private in various ways, 
stand outside this and offer critical vantage points on it. So one of the things that I think drives the interest in Arendt in a lot of circles and parts of feminism, and here's someone who's absolutely not a feminist who becomes central to feminist thought, right? What's going on? It's the breaking of a bunch of binaries. And Arendt helps break with binaries, including the public-private binary, which had a very structuring impact on feminism, right? It's a very pivotal one. So you've got the critique of public man, private woman running through lots of things. Then our answer says, don't be too fast with that. And don't be too fast with assuming a social democratic way out, um, assuming the just division of labor is going to be the path to the public sphere. So you can read in Arendt a critique of the kind of honet appropriation of C. Wright Mills and John Dewey and all of this. Um, because this is still only going to get at a better social in that sense. It's not going to get at the public in this deeper sense. It's not going to get at the capacity for transformative action and all of that. So it is categories like world making, which I think are the really interesting ones to appropriate from Arendt. And her comments on the public sphere, which are at once aristocratic elitist in a certain way and, and um, about heroic public action that would somehow transform this and very individualistic, yet make some points. So in relation to some of what, what you talked about and, and a broader concern that I've also traveled through in social history, this is a critique of thinking that micro histories in a certain way are gonna add up to the way out. That the a, a part of the trajectory of social history as we lived it throughout the last third of the 20th century was a search for um, agency at very small scales in ordinary life in lots of ways. And some of that became almost self-parodying in the micro-histoire movement in France. Some of it was fantastic and e evoked structures of autonomy and resistance in everyday life. But a critique that the Arendt position would sort of share with, say, an Eric Hobsbawm is, yeah, wait a minute, but the old working class history actually got onto some things that are completely missed by the new social history, which is so concerned with family life and demography and micro accounts and all of this that it misses when there are moments of purchase for large scale transformative change and where they come from, from a bigger political economy perspective. And in an odd way, Arendt, who is not at all part of this Marxist left, would agree. She makes the point that um, real action in history is rare, um, and that we need to pay attention to the fact that real action is rare, um, that it's unusual f to be able to have that transformative event. And real action comes through changing the terms of large-scale collective understandings of things, um, not just through the additive part. So it's a complicated story, but see, that's where Arendt becomes useful, troubling, because she's just so much always taking these slightly contrary positions, that, you know, what to do with this, but that world making isn't just the accumulation of the many small actions um, that change, you know, fertility behavior that changes over a 300-year period and produces a different structure of the family. It is also, right, sometimes transformative moments in this. They're rare and they're important. So that's what I would put on the table for Ryan. We see if there are any more. Oh. Okay. Yeah. This is. Uh, sorry. I just, I'll just keep my comment brief. I think. Okay. Just sort of. um, when, when you mentioned oh, the um, Occupy movement, the woman down there that mentioned the Occupy movement and the fact that most of the um, people involved were unemployed students, there were a lot of reports of. Um, specifically in New York, uh, people who had people who had apartments and jobs, <clears throat> who would after work um, go join the Occupy movement, sleep there, and they had jobs, they had houses. Um, these were probably the exceptions. And the way I saw the Occupy movement end was um, by the state, more or less, disassembling the. Um, disassembling it and not due to a lack of um, organization. And this, this actually is a follow-up to that because um, one of the 
things I don't want to do as a sort of old new leftist is to sort of prematurely write a post-mortem on one of the few signs of actual social innovation and opening up of possibilities in the current scene. And uh, partly it also we have to recognize the conditions of work have changed. The way these individuals make their livings is by improvisation very often and not through the forms of uh, organized corporations. But the one residue of Occupy Wall Street is Occupy Sandy, which is taking advantage of the same structures which as anarchists they took as forms of self-organization to occupy networks to reconstruct areas of New York that were damaged in uh, the storm. And this is the actual creation of forms of solidarity, of forms of cooperative labor on terms of non-domination, and of the creation of goods that are going to be shared on a basis of need rather than uh, the basis of, say, what the market's going to produce uh, in the aftermath of Sandy. So. Um, it, it does seem premature to uh, write this off as uh, an episodic phenomenon that can't have carry. Uh, it seems to me that it's uh, one way in which individuals in the current situation can begin to carve some space for actions that reflect liberty, equality, self-development, and fraternity. And um, that's probably going to take a different form now in the current economy than it would have taken 50 years ago. I, I agree. I, I like your framing, and I hope you're right. I wanted to make a very specific point by using that as an example. Um, I'm by no means condemning it. I felt the same way about it, it that you did. I was completely taken up by it. But at the same time, and, and even if we could imagine a new division of labor giving rise to a new form of public sphere, political public sphere, Clearly, it wouldn't take the old corporate forms. That's part of what I was doing by reciting the transition from the post-war oh, yeah, glorious didn't mean years you, to the present. You weren't anticipating uh, that. But it's unclear what it would look like in the present. And present prognostication is not something the social sciences ever can do. It's impossible. It's a positivist pipe dream. I hope you're right. But one would want some sort of linkage between the local movements and something larger. I guess Craig's notion of scale from Dewey would be one important corrective, maybe not even a corrective. Maybe it was just nipped in the bud too soon for it to make that transition. So um, bo bo to both comments, it's true, though, that the self the mediatic representation and even the representation of the, of the kind of modal participant by people like Chris Hedges in his book, Days of Destruction, Days of whatever the other part is, the last of what? Rage. Uh, the last chapter about San, about Occupy New York focuses on people who have not only who are not only unemployed but glorify the act of disengagement from the social division of labor. Now, of course, that's only one set of one set of people in the movement, but it's it's an I think it's interesting that that even has become such a dominant object of fascination for something that. Um, does seem to go against the idea of a political public sphere needing to be or having being mo being healthiest when it's rooted in some sense of a of, of, of a social division of labor, however that might look in the current transformed capitalism. So thanks to uh, my commentators, including the sadly now departed Jeff. Um, let me just raise a, a few points in response to their questions and then continue the larger conversation, which I think is more interesting. Um, and I won't even waste time on more apologies about having sent the text only um, the day before the talk. The, uh, I want to pick up um, something out of, of Jeff's very interesting extensive comments, um, even though he's not here, because I think it's interesting for all of us to think about some of these, these things, including the various, um, the, the historiography that he brought out. And I'll just note on that the extent to which we return to Habermas and the interesting thing that's become compelling out of this and my biographical connection to it and having 
organized that conference when the English language appeared, which you know, conference proceedings are probably the most cited thing I will ever have published, um, and and that it lives on in its you know, 21st reprinting, and it it keeps turning up in various places. So something got evoked in the intersection of this work of Habermas from uh, 27 years earlier and its appearance, of course, in 1989, and the way in which that conjuncture um, shapes this and what people were looking for. Um, one of the things that went on is that there was a looking for a better liberalism. Um, that a variety of people, Nancy Fraser has been evoked here, I think it's sort of an interesting example. So a variety of people who had been radical in some parts of their thinking had become increasingly liberals, um, unwilling to acknowledge this, and found in the public sphere discourse a way to begin a reconstruction of liberalism. So there are all manner of people who are sort of said, well, now that Ronald Reagan has attacked liberal, now that it's in a term of abuse, we actually don't find ourselves on Ronald Reagan's side of this particular abuse of liberalism. So our earlier abuse of liberalism from the left needs to be rethought. And in a certain analogy to Habermas, uh, because Habermas's 1962 sort of engagement with this, late 50s, early 60s, he's writing that book, is a discovery that there are categories of bourgeois liberal thought that might still have some liberatory potential, that might still be useful um, and not to be thrown out with the bathwater. So it's at once in dialogue with the silence of the Adenauer years, the refusal to engage with what had gone on um, in the Third Reich, and with a left that says there are no resources in ordinary liberal life, that there must be, and we can only have hope if we have hope in a deeper radical transformation. So Habermas sets out um, in a way that I think Jeff both talked about and continued, searching for a reason to be optimistic in a time which didn't seem to offer a lot of them. And the book is shaped by that. And its pathos has to do then with the fact that it ends up pessimistic, that it searches for, finds these resources, and then winds up saying, but it's degenerated, but it's broken down, and there's been a, a um, sort of de-differentiation of the division between public and private, and, um, and we are all now stuck again. And then he starts over, in a way, with a new set of conceptual tools, searching for optimism, and continues to be. And there is something important, and it goes right on through to the Occupy discussion, about searching for optimism, about you know, how disempowering it is if you can't find any place um, in which to locate a certain amount of optimism. So I, I want to sort of say that that's a, a really important part of all of this. More specifically in relation to Jeff's comments, I would say, though, that part of what went on, I think, in the period since that embrace of Habermas, but, but it's not just about Habermas, the whole discussion of the public and all of this, um, has a classical theory exemplified by Habermas that sets the bar too high, the bar for what will count as um, proper and active and effective citizenship. So it sets a very high bar for what will really count as the good public sphere and active citizenship. And what happens after that is a lowering of the bar that makes it much too low. So in the pursuit of inclusivity, there is a continual lowering of the bar until sort of anything um, done in a externally visible fashion begins to count as public. And so a little bit analogous to what I said about the microhistory movement and the earlier social history, there was a turn to a so-called new social history, history from the bottom up, starting in the 1960s, rooted in 60s radicalism and saying, look, we don't want to look at just names and dates, kings and battles. We want to look at the way in which ordinary people made history. This is a move that is liberatory, it's inclusive, um, and it produces lots of great works. Probably E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class is the greatest of these, but there are a bunch of candidates, huge work. And it has this limit that what it produces is an endless search for agency at, in small scales in everyday life, whether or not it results in large scale change. Right? The, the, a key feature of Thompson's argument is we shouldn't write off 
these radicals of the early 19th century because they didn't win. Right? And I think that's true, and it's a really important point, but it engenders then this whole series of accounts of people who don't win um, weapons of the weak in various ways without very much attention to what it would actually take to win, um, what it would be to be transformative. And so you get that, and you get it again with the expansion of public sphere. So let's point out that a variety of people also were somehow able to be engaged in public. Um, and, and so we don't have a very good balance between how to think about um, effectiveness, either in the Habermas and rational critical way or in other ways, and how to think about inclusivity. What we have is a problem, and I think it's perfectly well posed in the public counterpoint, counterpublic debates and elsewhere, the problem over and over again of how to think about that, and it's a problem in movements, and it's a problem in theory. Um, and we really don't have a satisfactory um, very stable account of this. We may be best off just saying it's a problem in confronting it, but it's not confronted by just saying, therefore, inclusivity is obviously the right answer, which is the main answer that's been given by most of the work. And how can you be against inclusivity? But what do you lose if you aren't able to stabilize it? It's a little bit like something everybody must have encountered at some point, that the way in which listservs sprang up um, around important intellectual topics and critical work. Um, and somebody said, well, I want to have an you know, online discussion of the kind of things we discuss in seminars. You know, in Michigan, at CSST in the old days, we had these intense discussions and we grasped um, critically key work. If only we could do this online and at very large scale. So somebody creates a listserv or a bulletin board or a forum and then a new techniques. We have new mediated versions of these. And it quickly gets debased. Um, because pretty soon, it is a variety of freshmen saying, I've been told to write a paper about Habermas. What did he say? Um, and it's not anymore that intentional discussion. So that the exclusivity actually played a role um, that was positive in some way. And we're very, we have a hard time in liberal thinking accepting that. And it's the counterpublic idea also, because the counterpublic idea gets its meaning from being able to have a certain amount of autonomy, but it also gets a lot of its political significance from the demand and claim on being included. And so it, it cuts both ways. And so mere inclusivity um, erases counterpublics. Now, this goes to the move point and to a lot of others. The, it erases the agonism um, of the public sphere, right? Everybody's included. Right? But it then becomes the kind of thing that Marcuse and, and uh, Robert Paul Wolf knows were criticizing in the critique of um, pure tolerance, uh, right? the way in which a kind of soft acceptance, you're OK, I'm OK, you're included, I'm included, is actually the enemy of critical engagement in mean, all of this. So I think that this is a problem act we could approach in several different ways that runs through um, lots and lots of this. and. Um, and I think that, that what we are coming out of is a long period of maximizing inclusivity and seeing everything as negative exclusivity, which often was, in fact, the boundedness that enabled agonism and enabled effectiveness. I think that on protests and so forth, the, we can say the glass is half full or half empty. I'll come back in a moment. But, um, but that's sort of an open question, right? That a lot. But part of what happens is a proliferation of small movements. So the idea of movements gets on the agenda in the 1970s. That old collective behavior, mass society, um, it's all breakdown. It gets defeated in academic terms and in many ways politically. There are movements. People talk about the movement, but then they talk about movements. And then the movements get ever smaller, and it starts being the movement over a three-week period that worked on this issue in this locality. Now, notice how that echoes the public sphere and the social history discussion. It used to be the working class movement. Now it's, well, we have the anti-nuclear movement. We have this and we have that and all these sorts of things. And people start yearning for coalitions. How do you put that back together? Um, but it's a similar, ver a similar story in a, in a different engagement. Now, what are the issues here to the public sphere? Well, 
local citizenship, good for lots of things, has a hard time reaching global issues. If we're really worried about climate change, if we're really worried about the global financial situation, that isn't going to reach it, right? Do we just dismiss it or do we figure out some way to connect it? My own view would say that the issue is how to connect here. Um, it is not one or the other. It's not, no, we should abandon all that local activism, but it isn't in and of itself going to connect. And that comes up in several ways. It comes up in um, the learning, the longing for local community in Dewey, that nostalgia. And Michael says rightly, and I said it yesterday, that this is a problematic nostalgia. They hope to get back to local community, investing that in face-to-faceness. I really like Michael's comments on the complexity of, of the face-to-face, -face, which is all over the place because it's in crowds and it's in cruising and it's in um, all these things, not just in its idealized form. Slight defense for Charles Horton Cooley, which is he sort of knew that because his point with it was that um, it's significant, and I think, um, and it's significant partly because of the way in which there are opportunities to expand face-to-face -face relationships sometimes. But his main point was it cuts across what he called primary and secondary groups, that that's not the distinction, that you have to look in other places. So a feature of primary groups is face-to-faceness, but that's not enough to distinguish them from your casual interactions with clerks at the supermarket or all manner of other kinds of secondary relationships. Um, but in any case, I think we we need not only to abandon the nostalgia for local community or town hall kinds of democracy, but connect in a different way. And that phrase, you know, people have been talking about connecting, think globally, act locally, and all these things for a long time. That connection simply hasn't been forged in any very serious way. And um, we've had a variety of, of sort of illusions of getting to it. Um, in Michael's talk, there are several other things that I think are, are really interesting about this and about ways we need to think more than ever in an online context, though they're not all unique to an online context, um, and, and a range of things the, about the data which may be gathered from surveillance, the question of whether being in public eliminates claims to privacy. And I think his discussion of obscurity was helpful, though we need to do a lot more thinking. I'm also taking Lee Schlesinger message mentioned during the break the importance of bringing Schutzian kind of thinking about um, a range of gradations and different categories into play here, um, and the way in which we structure our awareness or non-awareness of others in the world at any point in time, which we have um, a lot of different ways. That's a complex, big question I won't try to go to. But one thing I note in that, that connected to Michael's uh, particular comments about this uh, or a couple of things. One is how much we try to think about privacy still in um, possessive individualist terms, that is ownership. So the way we think about data and these violations of our personal data is um, in terms of property. So people want royalties on the use of their information in search engines, right? That is, they want it to be seen as property in some sense that they own about themselves their reflections in data sets. Um, and it's a terribly limited and limiting category for this. Another thing is the way in which achieving obscurity figured in the old sociological account of anonymity of urban life, um, and people like Zimmel talking about the um, positive side and sometimes negative side of urban life that involved capacities for anonymity. And what I would just put on the table is the extent to which the link to Bourdieu, we bring a habitus, we bring a sort of embodied way of thinking about anonymity to the web that comes from the um, way in which urban anonymity was constructed. So nobody will know you. They don't know who you are. Um, therefore, as you go various places, you can be obscure. Right, um, You can be anonymous, not identified. And I think people extend that from its partially genuine earlier urban incarnation into the way they imagine going places on the web where it is all traceable um, and not obscurable to a certain sense. And nobody knows you, and yet they can know all about you. Um, and so that things are vastly more traceable. If you ask the question, why do people keep leaving traces on the web. They know at some level that well, it, their embodied understanding of being anonymous 
in other forms of life gets carried over, and dangerously so, if they want to protect any sort of so-called privacy there. But I, th I like the discussion of obscurity in that connection. Um, George also raised a, a bunch of points that are really interesting. I will tr pick up on only a couple just so we, I can stop speaking. Um, in his discussion about trying to think with Bourdieu at the same time as thinking with Habermas and, and publics, the larger topic that I'm interested in, one of the things I think is important is to make the field concept not too rigid and formulaic, and to keep it always connected to forms of capital um, and projects of action. And, and as they move through this in time, I actually attended Bourdieu's lectures that became that posthumous book. And they were a big move forward because it was the most historical Bourdieu ever got um, about thinking about all of this. Um, and yet it kept deploying the um, field concept without doing something else that elsewhere in his work he did constantly, which was talk about the convertibility of forms of capital and the, the ways in which in different practical projects people relied on moving among these, transactions among um, fields, which I think are, are very important in this. Um, and in speaking about um, fields of publics, partly I did want to think with, with Bourdieu, um, in the general idea of fields, but I wanted to pick up on the extent to which the field concept suggests more than, say, the Mufian account of agonism. It suggests that there's some structure to the agonism and that you can expect certain kinds of oppositions to keep coming up recurrently and analogically over and over again in different events. So an opposition between the economic and the cultural or something like that will be reproduced in lots of these things. So it's not just a proposition. The, the Mufian version of this is like a proposition about you know, life and human nature at the same time that it's a proposition about what counts as the properly good political. Um, and it is that people are agonistic. And there's a version of Bourdieu that's like that. Uh, there's a version of Bourdieu that is, you know, a rugby player. So it's, people are always fighting, you know, and they're pushing, and that's, that's what goes on. Um, but there's another version that says, and yet it's socially organized, and there are institutional structures, and it's not just agonism. Right? It is the production of hierarchies of distinction. It is the production of organized fields of opposition in which these fields always are related to that which is outside of them. So every one of these field arguments in Bourdieu is related to the larger field of power. And I want to say about movements, that all these movements are related to each other in contentions and to larger structures of, of power at the same time um, in all of that. The, let me leap ahead a little bit just to a couple of, of concluding comments. Um, back to scale, which I simply recurrently, for long you're saying, is so important in this. It's been a baby thrown out with the bathwater recurrently. It was thrown out with the bathwater of functionalist analysis. It was thrown out with the bathwater of modernization theory. It was thrown out with the bathwater of classical Marxism. I mean, there have been recurrent occasions in which theoretical attempts in the last 35 years, in which theoretical attempts to get a handle on the massive construction of large-scale social organization don't get much purchase in favor of versions of more micro, more immediate um, understandings. So economics goes through the, the sort of micro remaking. If you're as old as I am and you took an economics class, it started with the macro and worked to the micro, right? Um, after um, the late 80s, um, that stopped being the way any textbooks in economics were written. They all did a micro foundationalist up from individual strategic action kind of problems, right? But it wasn't just economics. It was micro history. It was a turn in anthropology against macro analysis. It was all over the place during this neoliberal financial era. So precisely at this moment when there's the forging of this very large scale web of global interconnections and financial capitalism, social science abandons that entire project. It abandons the 1970s political economy versions of it, Marxist and non-Marxist, um, it, and it more or less embraces its own versions of the micro and cultural interpretive and a variety of other things, some of which are great, right? But 
they really need to be connected up to the rest of what's going on. So we're disempowering. Movements disempower themselves in partially similar ways by embracing the most immediate contexts of action often. Um, and, um, and yet, right, there are some signal movement successes. Um, and so I want to try to, to get at that. I would add that it's not just scale, it's complexity. It's the internal interweaving. So just to put it in a phrase, after the 2009 market collapse, uh, the phrase too big to fail kept being used, but it really should have been too connected to fail. Really what was at stake with not letting more big institutions collapse like Lehman Brothers collapsed was all of their connections to everything else that would have pulled so much else down. And that this was the phenomena that we should be looking at. And I've tried to talk about with indirect relations and I'm sort of interested in the Dewey anticipations. In this connection, um, it's true, uh, I'm still responding to George, that there are limits to the national because what we see is the global and international. But I think people draw wrong conclusions from that, and Dewey drew a wrong conclusion from that, in the idea that therefore you simply have to look for the public at the scale of the interconnections. Because I think this amounts to looking for the public in a place where it hasn't been built enough to possibly be efficacious. So that what you, and Dewey says some other things that are useful. He says habit is really important important, habit is the wellspring of action and the um, embeddedness in cultural institutions. So we could recast that account of the local community from a nostalgic longing to what are the contexts in which we have enough capacity for action on a combination of habits and culture on the one hand and institutions and networks on the other to begin to do something about some of these global things. And it won't be simply the global public sphere. There's been a lot of celebration of, well, a global public sphere. The global public sphere is not efficacious in relation to global financial capital or climate change or a variety of things. Being able to mobilize nation states may actually sometimes be more efficacious. And so one of the issues is that nations may actually be counter publics of a kind. Um, that in an interesting way, the friction in relationship to dominant capitalist globalization may sometimes be organized as resistance to Western domination or resistance in various ways there. We shouldn't write off all of that in our pursuit to get the, the grandest public. Um, so we have, on the one hand, all the cooperative movements, local barter and exchange movements, the movement for an alternative lifestyle as a response to the nastiness of the giant and the global. Um, but then we have the World Social Forum and various attempts to reconstruct. Um, what we have is a general turn against the arenas in which there were previously bits of social democracy, labor organization, all these sorts of things, the, the, the national states. Um, Occupy is really interested in this. I think it's more a moment than a movement. Um, and that isn't a complete depth. So link it to Arendt. It's a performance um, as much as it is movement building. So it's constantly faulted by people from the older left for not building enough network ties, not doing its institutional linkages, and there are really good criticisms of this. But what it is, in some part, is a dramatic performance in a mediated public sphere. And the performativity is sort of vital. We should be sort of seeing that as, as part of what goes on, and we should see movements in structures of endurance and recurrence. So that if we talk about the women's movement, we're talking about something that goes on over centuries, um, winning partial successes and suffering many losses on the way. But you can't understand it as though it sprang into being in the late 60s, early 70s in some way, that, that it was you know, started by um, feminine mystique or second sex, right? And so there is this whole production of ancestry well, let us go back to Murray Wollstonecraft. Let us go back to Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Let us go back to, right? Um, but there is a sense. What you're talking about is recurrent waves of mobilization, um, long periods of abeyance, many defeats, and recurrence, and coming back and doing it again. And movements happen like that. They don't happen in three weeks. It's so it's not a criticism of Occupy. It's a question of is there recurrence and endurance and pattern to it. And the, this relates to the field of public's idea because part of what we see is every one of those recurrences of feminism, which wasn't called feminism from the outset, 
occurs at the same time as an efflorescence of a bunch of other movements. Every one of those recurrence recurs in, is in the context of other movements with other themes, right? different in the 1820s and 30s than it is in the 1960s. But in each time, it's movement activity in general in a certain sense, an efflorescence of the field, which produces lots of different versions of it in various relationships to each other, religious movements, peace movements, anti-Masonic movements that were actually linked to early women's movements at one time, and they, varieties of these. So instead of writing these as isolated histories, each thread pulled out of the fabric, we need to look for what is going on with that recurrence in which the whole field of movement activity undergoes um, a boom period and sort of declines. An interesting thing about our current moment, and then I'll shut up, is how little movement response the debacles of financial capitalism produced. Occupy eventually managed to capture center stage, the slogans and so forth, but there was incredibly little before that. The dominant movement structures of our period are anti-political movements right, of various kinds. Um, in Italy, um, Five Points and, and Beppe Grillo, um, the New Dawn in Greece, the Tea Party in the US, all these things which are not simply rightist, they are in many ways anti-political. They are about um, the, the impossibility, meaninglessness, general corruption of politics. And, and, and that's what we're getting as the dominant movement. And this is a concern, I think, for us. And I want to embrace what Jeff said at the beginning, um, and I hope that I didn't sound so totally pessimistic about it as to not be on the same side of saying we need sources for optimism. And public sphere thinking, or thinking about publicness, as I want to recast it, can, I think, open some things up in this, but it also needs to be coupled with critical political economy and other kinds of things. And, in, and I would specifically dissociate myself from the world state thread, which is where Dewey is headed, not because I can't see some advantages, but with Arendt, I don't see much possibility. But even more, it seems to me, we need to situate that and say the conjuncture offers two directions, one of which is this continual, if only we had a world state discussion, which has been going on since globalization and capitalism started. Um, but the other of which is decoupling and um, the search for resilience and smaller scale ways to survive. And how that decoupling could be benign rather than um, destructive seems to me to be a more pivotal current question. If, the, if there are lots of reasons to expect deep systemic problems, call them crises or whatever, in our future, um, and decoupling and looking for some sort of resilience and ability to deal with these is a strategy, that could be exclusive and destructive in terrible ways, right? Or it could be more benignly organized, and we should be asking about that question. This isn't most immediately relevant, but it was a comment provoked by where George started, but I just would like to hear all three of you respond, and it's at a somewhat more abstract level. It's the problem of relating Habermas and Bourdieu, where Habermas somehow deep down is rooted uh, in an unquestioned exercise of reason. And the Bourdieu I want to consider is less the field aspects of it, but more the illusio, and the f which I'll put in another term from that Bourdieu uses, that misrecognition is essential to constituting any social action, any social structure, any ongoing uh, you know, making of the social world. Uh, and so I, I'm just, I understand from in terms of scholarly production as well as the needs for political discourse why one might want to relate Habermas and Bourdieu, but I wonder if this, there's some real deep contradiction in that. And just to pursue, I'm just a little skeptical of the optimism. Uh, in fact, as a cultural anthropologist, I might just see this as some Americanist trait. Uh, and, you know, there, there's, there's a 
there's just a, I wonder how that interferes with the kind of social analysis that we might need even for a different kind of politics, which may be no better than we've had, but would be different from what we've had. But, but it's, the, it's, the, kind, it's the, the role of illusion. I mean, there's even an illusion in this optimism. We're playing in a game that we want to come out right, whereas the Bordeauxian insight, as I understand it, is that it's always a game that itself is in question because of another game. And if the field of power is an ultimate field, is the last field, that itself is a less Bordeauxian notion. notion. Anyway, that's, that's the kind of level. That, that. I think the, um, Craig, uh, in the original article, what I thought was so great is that he, in a way, made Bourdieu swallow Habermas. It wasn't so much an articulation. It was showing that the restriction of the public sphere was perfectly compatible with Bourdieu's <coughs> description of the field as, a, as an exclusive thing with its own rules and so on. Am I right, Craig? And yeah. I was trying to see if we could push it beyond that, but it's not an attempt at an academic reconciliation by any means. It's, it's trumping it's Habermas. Not, yeah. <laughs> it's not symmetrical reconciliation. Not, yeah. I do think that there is an issue in Bourdieu to which, if you will, we could make Habermas speak, but it wouldn't be in the terms of a symmetrical, you know, putting them in a blender and coming out with the, the mix. And, and that issue is that, that Bourdieu has a running um, thinness in discussions of politics. And, um, and it's chronic. And so George makes reference to this posthumous, this very late work that comes out of his Collège France lectures. Um, which is an unusual bit of Bourdieu for dealing head on with something that is always the implicit background of his work. So the state is always there, it's always framing, although you can't read distinction or read the rules of art without the state. But there's, and there's you know, the state nobility, but it turns out to be about elite professional schools, right? And so, well, no, what about the state from Francis I through? What are we going to do with this? And it's at one level in advance, and you're waiting for, you've been waiting for him for a long time to do this, to deal with history, and at another level, he short circuits himself, I think, in the book, um, because he does something Lee just said, which is look for the last um, field, right? And, and that is he, he imposes a kind of closure on a theory, the brilliance of which was often invested in not being closed, in having a structured um, ambiguity and opposition, a sense of the productivity of, of these kinds of tensions. Like part of what he shared with Foucault, um, with whom he shared a lot of things, was that sense of the way um, what Foucault would call a discursive formation was talk that would generate more talk, right? It was, it was you know, individualism. That just, that wasn't, that was a putative answer to questions that only raised more questions, that only created new ambiguities and unraveled and re-raveled and all kinds of things. And Bourdieu thought like that too. And so his conceptual toolkit is full of things that don't resolve completely. And that's part of their power. And at the very late work, it seems to me, he tries to wrap this up too much with a bow and, and undercuts a little bit of the strength of his own generative theory in that sense. I like your call for paying attention to illusio and misrecognition um, at every level. Of course, Bourdieu thinks that there's no recognition without misrecognition, um, and therefore that it is not simply error or false consciousness. Um, and that it's at every level in the sense of the big macroscopic claims through to the um, immediate personal um, capacity to act in that. And the, you know, most of Bourdieu's work could be read as a kind of, I've said in that article George alluded to, a, a critique of the post-war boom for its false promises. Um, and sort of over and over again. It's, it said it was bringing equality, but look, right? And that nuance is important, and so it, it's there. Um, I will defend the American trait of optimism in a qualified way, <laughs> uh, which is that I do think there is something about capacity to act which does not derive from the mere hypothesis of a better um, possible future um, and doesn't derive from necessity but derives from optimism or hope or you know, constructed different ways. Optimism as a construction is maybe a problem because it implies an expectation rather than a hope. 
I was thinking earlier about the evocations of Habermas in this. Habermas tries to be a imminent, tries to do imminent critique in the Frankfurt School vein that there are, are sources in what's going on now for the transcendence of what's going on now. And it's a matter of finding those sources and building on them that can enable you both to criticize the limits of what's going on now, it's failing to realize its potential, and see the possibility for moving somewhere. Um, that seems to be, for example, completely um, missing from the MOOF argument, I would say, and, um, and is a, a important difference and something to ask and think about in relation to all these other theorists, whether, whether there is a locating of anything to build on. And in our current circumstance, is the optimism warranted or unwarranted? That is, if, the, if, the, you know, if what we mean is not Pollyanna expectation, but seeing something to build on, it's tough. Right. And it's not just tough in relation to all the kinds of political oppression or failures of recognition we've cited. It's tough where a completely viable way of thinking about it looks like catastrophism. Um, right. What we should really expect is massive catastrophe. Um, and now, are there ways to survive or not survive that massive catastrophe? Should we care? Are there, you know, what? The, how's it going to play out? Is the real impact of the environment going, uh, environmental crisis going to be that we start having such wars in anticipation of it, that that's the form it takes, or that we start having economic breakdowns and crisis, or that, you know, but it's catastrophism. That's the sort of default way the future looks. And trying to find some hook for potential collective action to deal with this seems the challenge, if you want to call it, of, of trying to have even the glimmer of um, hope or optimism in that, but also the capacity to act rather than simply fatalistically accept. Could I just say one, one thing about the Bourdieu lectures on the state that I found remarkable, though, reading them, is that the very first lecture deals with something that breaks out of the field format completely, which is parastatal commissions. And he says, this is going to bore all of you to death, but I'm going to talk about these nominated commissions and government yeah. by commission, and it breaks through the public-private boundary and it breaks through the state. So I think he kept his flexibility even in those. But there are yeah. these highly formulaic art articles that got a lot of circulation where the state becomes a meta field governing all the other fields. And I think that really does break with, with his no, better no. impulses. No, no. And on the optimism thing, I think this really would, would the way Fred, uh, Craig, Craig has just reframed optimism, would make a difference, for example, for the, in the evaluation of the, of the Occupy movement, the point that Liz brought up earlier. When, when the question comes whether they're going to accept an alliance with labor unions or not, if you believe that public, a, public, a political public sphere of a democratic sort depends upon, in some respect, however that's theorized, the division of labor, you can't exclude the labor unions. And that really makes a difference then. And that, so optimism of a sort of a, a imagining that a division of labor would be so connected allows you to think about what you should accept at the moment of decision. And that's why, it's, why there's political philosophy and not just political behavioralism, <laughs> I guess. I, I, don't, I don't feel very much sympathy with the criticism of Occupy because um, because I worry that the, uh, the yardstick by which one gauges the effectiveness of a movement uh, is, an ex is, an, that is a decisive global political change, transformation through something that looks an awful lot like sovereign action. That is to say, um, foresight, rational analysis, deliberate intervention that produces predictable effects that are totally transformative. That's the way we get seduced into this sovereign subjectivity. Uh, and it may be that that is exactly part of the problem. I mean, that would be a Foucauldian response to this kind of problem, that, uh, that our very aspirations to radicalism manifest the form of governmentality um, and, uh, and requires some backing away from. The nice thing about the Occupy refusal to engage politics as usual and its uh, heavily um, economized infrastructure is that um, uh, it reanimates, uh, you know, the, the sense of aspiration to belong differently, and that, it's, of course, this has got a long history. You think about abolition and uh, before the Civil War. The, um, I'm thinking of the old uh, Eileen Crattiter 
uh, book on uh, means and ends in American abolition, where the the uh, there was a big debate between Stanley Elkins and, and Crowder about the refusal of Garrison and Thoreau and others to engage the party system because the Constitution legitimized slavery, and so this profound imagination of externality that runs through the um, abolitionist movement and, and is a feature of almost all the social movements at some level or another, yeah. seems to me to be really the most powerful thing about them. And so to reintroduce the yardstick of um, a kind of sovereign transformation seems to me a, uh, a blinding. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wanted to ask Craig to speak a little bit more about this in uh, in your critique of the bottom-up microhistory uh, kind of understanding, I agree with you entirely about what you say uh, in, the, in that determined quest to validate agency uh, at, at all levels. That uh, explains why American historians were so uh, unsympathetic and incapable of reading Foucault, among other things. Uh, and. Uh, and I just wonder if oh, you were sympathetic and misread him. Uh, so, so <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, and, and here again, let me look, while we're on the subject of Foucault, which is not really where I intended to go, but um, it, in the uh, discussion about Arendt earlier and, and the social, I think Hannah Pitkin is entirely unfair to Arendt there. Um, it, it's true that Arendt in the human condition doesn't spell out very much what she means by how society in that sense or the social is produced or or what its um, practices or manifestations are. But, the, but the, the, that's part of the Heideggerianism that I think she just is swimming in. Um, that also found manifestation in exactly the same years in uh, Kangyam and early Foucault. Yeah. Um, that is, that there are various processes of uh, um, uh, social knowledge and uh, attitudes of governmentality embedded in those processes of social knowledge that constitute for us a kind of imagination of the social. There's a, a lot of what you were saying about uh, uh, about the way Arendt is uh, is trying to draw our attention to the way uh, even something like income inequality is imagined um, in this right. aggregate of particular. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's actually very similar to the framework yeah. of yeah, knowledge sure. that construes us as having sexuality in yeah. in yeah. Volonté de Absolutely. Savoir. So uh, let's not dismiss that critique. I think it, if, if it's fleshed out in the way that Foucault tried to do through the um, multiplicities of forms of expert knowledges of the social that uh, capillate, uh, if, if one can put it that way, a kind of governmentality uh, for which the state is, is just one manifestation or just one postulate, um, then, then uh, I think it has a lot more substance than Hannah Pitt could ever credit it. Was happening. I, I agree with that totally. I mean, it's going further in the direction, I would say, where I sort of said, well, Pickens got this critique, it has a lot of purchase, but let's not throw the baby out yeah. of the bathwater, we want to claim something. And you're saying, well, it's really, her critique wasn't that great. I'm sympathetic. I think that the partial defense of the Pickens style critique and of all the other people who felt unsettled about the society thing isn't that aren't so anti egalitarian and this is, it's that it is not integrated into an account that's very compelling of why it's there. And the problem with the account of the social is that it just seems to come up, that's the one thing, and, and do this, and sort of swallow so much of society. And it's not unrelated to Heidegger's technology discussions, right? Which are onto something that is significant about technology and yet make it a sort of tertium gallon kind of thing. Here it comes, here comes technology. Wait a minute, I wasn't watching. Where did it come from? You know, what's going on? There is an account to be constructed, Bert Dreyfus has spent half his career trying to construct it, right? Around the way in which from the Greeks, leap over everything in the middle, but from the Greeks to the present, you, you have this production of it. And where I'd say a kind of Foucaultian and or Bourdieuian sort of um, what we're getting at is you need to figure out not just the negative side of what it makes go wrong, but what it is being used for, why people find it enabling in their attempts to be who they are and do what they want in various ways. So whether it's Foucault on sexuality or not, it's not a one-sided critique that just says, or individual more generally, which is behind the sexuality thing, the, the you know, this bad thing happened, then we were like this. Um, and it's and the aren't positions a little more like that 
And what one, one wants is an account of why it's produced and reproduced. And so in, a, in the Bourdieu sense of reproduction, why do we keep producing and reproducing this phenomenon? Which is that it's doing some work for us, where it's enabling us to do a lot of stuff. Maybe those are distorted ends or goals. Maybe it's not, should be our highest sense of ourselves in Chuck Taylor's sense or something. But, um, but you can't get a grip on it. I think a good Bourdieu's imposture would be, you haven't gotten a grip on something going on if you don't understand why it continues to be produced and reproduced. Mm -hmm. We have more questions on the floor. Yeah, uh, Sylvia Pedraza, Sociology and American Culture. Um, I've been listening to you guys and thinking that all the examples that you usually bring to bear on the topic of the public and the private, uh, most of the time it's been Occupy and the gay movement. And I'm thinking that there is another very important social movement going on in the United States right now uh, that where the public and the private intertwine, I think, in very interesting ways. And that is the movement that has to do with what is usually called comprehensive immigration reform. You know, uh, It has to do with the legalization of the so uh, estimated 12 million undocumented people in the United States. People who, because they're undocumented, have for, you know, some of them have been here 20 years and so on, led very private lives. They didn't want to be seen in public in any way. They drove carefully, you know, they tried not to um, make too much noise over the weekend. You know, they, they really were trying not to have a public presence at all because if they were afraid, because they were undocumented, you know. And all of a sudden, in the last couple of years, I think roughly beginning around 2006, they began to have a public presence because they began to march on marches. You know, uh, be because most of the people involved, the 12 million people, are people who have very low levels of education, uh, you know, do uh, service type work, agriculture, and cutting vegetables, and hotel rooms, and things like that. These are not people that can write letters to the, you know, opinion pages of the New York Times or Dallas Times or whoever, and grab it in any way. You know, so that what the ways in which they could be public were very delimited. You know, and yet I think that they used them very effectively. They started marching, wearing, uh, using placards that said. Uh, things like, well, first of all, the marches were enormous, and so it brought the, you know, the 12 million suddenly had, they weren't face to face because they were protected by the enormous uh, nature of the marches. They were, in fact, in some ways anonymous, even though they were in huge crowds. But they put up placards where they said, we are not criminals, you know, we are working people. And so they delivered the message, you know. And I think that they also did something <coughs> else. My, our late colleague that we still miss in the sociology department, Mayor Salt, had a very old theory about resource mobilization, you know, that social movements are as successful as the resources that they managed to grab. And I think that the other resource that they managed to grab is that they managed to grab the uh, legal documented resident, often citizen population that is Hispanic in the United States, that they made it their issue. And they communicated to Obama that that was what they wanted from him, that like all Americans, they cared about jobs and they cared about the economy and joblessness, but that as Hispanics, what they wanted was comprehensive immigration reform, okay? And Obama, in effect, promised. He said, I couldn't do it the first term because, you know, I was too busy with Obamacare and that took up all my time, but I will get to it my second term, okay? And so as soon as the second term began, these movements, I mean, there's now uh, groups of eight senators and eight people in the House. Uh, which are bipartisan, Republican and, and Democrat both, where all the Hispanic Congress folks, which are both Republican and Democrats, also made it their issue, okay? But, but what has more than anything else, I, say, I think, made, made them able to grab the, the public presence that they now have, and it, you know, they just had an enormous march in Washington, D.C. this Wednesday. Um, and for example, the young people who are now called the Dreamers, okay, who also, uh, wanted so much to be legalized because it means for them a college education and so on. And the DREAM Act, as we know, failed by just a few votes, but then, um, you know, in effect, Obama inter intervened and said, you know, with an executive order that you can have a temporary suspension of, you know, uh, the undocumented nature so that you can, in fact, continue in education. Now, not nowhere near as many as are estimated, given their age group and so on, as could have come forth, has come forth, so that they're still afraid. 
Okay. Uh, so, you know, I think, you know, the public and the private is, is very interesting the way it intertwines a lot with these cases, you know. But anyway, the Dreamers have now gone to Washington in this March on Wednesday and they have become public, okay? And they have said, you know, here we are and, you know, this is what we want. And I, I just think it's an issue where I think if you pay close attention to it, you will see that the, the public and the private intertwined in, in interesting ways. I think that's all right, so I agree completely. I suspect we all do. I'd, I'd add, apropos of what I said, and then Michael expanded on, on the gay rights movement, one of the interesting similarities is the channeling into work, education, family um, as canonical dominant American claims, which enables this um, movement of uh, immigrants and for immigration reform to fit into an American dream language. So at one level, you could just, in a sociology and social movement, say good tactics. At another level, you see the way the public sphere canalizes and organizes. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I, I see strong parallels between um, the kind of dialectic uh, or contradictions that are, that are unfolding in the gay movement and in immigration, that there's a structured reasons why uh, a meme like Dreamers catches on uh, and, and, and appeals and that has to do partly with uh, a kind of reprioritization among the demands. Um, so if you, the, the, everything I've seen about the emerging deal among these, this gang of eight uh, is to me a little bit horrific because they're, they're putting all of the border securitization measures right up front uh, as the condition that has to be fulfilled before anything else kicks in, and they include really extreme measures like surveillance of the full border, um, sea to sea. Constant surveillance of every inch of the border is, is being named in this bill as one of the conditions for uh, uh, according with documentation, which after all is another kind of uh, um, uh, rise of society, transparency, <laughs> exactly. So, so yet but at the same time, of course, you know, it's it's fa it's fantastic <laughs> to watch this thing unfold. I um, I am fascinated in all of these cases, though, with uh, with the way they sort of challenge our language for uh, action. Because the uh, the thing that happens in a movement context is as much the transformation of coll of collective subjectivity in the movement as it is consequential action upon the environment of the movement. So think about the gay movement, where it's very striking. Um, in the early periods of the gay movement, uh, what we now call the gay movement. Um, all of the or language of organization had to be routed through those third person categories of objective social knowledge that were in, uh, intensely hostile, um, homosexuals and, and, uh, and perverts and Uranians and third sex and so on. Um, and the, uh, and the, the farther you go along, the more people have a sense of belonging to a collective subject that is that they can more or less uh, inhabit. But that's a product of a, a whole series of small struggles that then abandon earlier understandings and, uh, and so on. So the, the history of the movement is as much a history of emergence into subjectivity um, as it is consequential action. And I think, exactly. I think this is true in all the movements. I mean, this is true. We're, we're less likely to see it in the case of, let's say, the women's movement because uh, there's a kind of uh, uh, you know, persistence of an age-old category of gender that, that uh, looks like the underlying uh, ground of continuity. But of course, what it means to be a woman has as much been transformed by this whole series of actions and mobilizations and different framings of the collectivity and reflections on framings of the collectivity. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's the real action in a, in a lot of ways in the social movement context. Another reason why we shouldn't measure these movements by the yardstick of political consequentiality. I would just say that <clears throat> backing off both your earlier comment and, and the response to Sylvia here, one thing that's remarkable to me is, the, is to go back to Lee's point, the Americanness of the discu discussion. Because if you look at the literature on social movements in Europe, uh, and Craig has written about this, the new social movements concept, 
only appears in continental Europe when the social movement, the labor movement, has declined in significance as a result of the deconstruction of the post-war Fordist cooperative labor management relations and the emergence of the welfare state and the, de and the deconstruction of spatial inequalities. It's impossible, of course, to know whether that structure could have been open to the kinds of topics that the new social movements then proceeded to raise, like immigration reform in Germany, in the case for Turks primarily and others, in all of these countries, gay rights, the women's movement. But there's, I think, no reason to expect that they wouldn't have been able to, to the extent that they were society-wide movements. And so I think there's a, there's a bit of a, um, uh, a glorification of the de facto condition that we live in, which is in fact deprived in some respect vis-a-vis -vis those earlier ones. That, so I, I, don't, I don't see any need to channel things into a movement. I think those movements could have been and often were quite expansive. I mean, pre, not, obviously not vis-a-vis -vis the gay movement in the Weimar Republic, but in the same national, international context where gay rights be, and exited from obscurity and became part of the public sphere, why should we assume that the post-war accords of Fordism and labor management cooperation and social democratic governance wouldn't have expanded to that? If you look at, Chantal Mouffe was asked this question two weeks ago in the same room, and the movement that she pointed to as exemplifying the politics she would embrace was the union of the left in the last French election, and particularly the candidate Mélenchon. Mélenchon, Mélenchon embraced all social movement demands in his program. It was a unified program of the left and of all no, new social movement demands. There was nothing exclusive whatsoever about it. Now, of course, he didn't win, but you know, I think that was, that's, that's the kind of movement that we're absolutely fundamentally missing in the United States. And so we're, we're, you know, maybe we need a separate set of categories for understand, for analyzing the U.S., uh, where these things are so unthinkable to us. We've entered into injury time. I think there's one more question before the end of the official proceedings, and we can carry on over lunch. Is there anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask a question who'd like to do so? Uh, this is something I've been puzzling about. It's, I, thank you for a, a, a wonderful uh, lecture and a fantastically interesting panel discussion. Um, a huge amount to think about. And one thing I have been trying to think about is uh, a, an important source of social mobilization uh, of various kinds historically and in the contemporary world that I don't know quite how to fit into this schematic of publicness we've been uh, discussing is uh, religion. Um, given the large amount of collective activity that it's helped underwrite and mobilize, and the various forms that uh, it, it's, it's taking uh, in the contemporary world to, to make some significant changes, I'm just not sure how, how that fits into the scheme of, um, of publicness that we've been describing. Is it, is it to be understood in those terms? Does it need special terms? And I don't know. Oh, well, I'm, I'm currently trying to finish a book that argues that evangelicalism is essentially just uh, religiosity in public sphere forms. Uh -huh. um, and Craig has just published a book that argues that evangelicals are, in a way, the mother load of the social movements. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we both agree, uh, I think, that some forms of religiosity are, are absolutely essential to understanding uh, public sphere and vice versa. But uh, this is where the category religion might might be unhelpful is that that doesn't really pick out all forms of religiosity. Yeah. Um, and in my view, there is nothing that picks out all forms of religiosity. Uh, yeah. uh, so it would be surprising if there were. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I do it. Well, Michael and I are in agreement, so I won't belabor the point. There's no it exactly that's religion, it's a misplaced it. Yeah. But there are things we call religion or religiosity that have this impact. The point about evangelicals is also overlaps a theme for which maybe you could take Andre Gortz's term non-reformist reforms as, as an embodiment. That is, the various ways in which the unintended as well as indirect consequences of mobilization are huge in this. So you know, the Second Great Awakening um, is a font of movement activity of various kinds, including renewal of women's movement and parts of the anti-slavery movement and all kinds of things going on, which greatly exceed the objectives of those seminarians who are trying to organize parts of this in some cases. And, and this, I mean, I'm 
trying to say, so I'm working for ways to be clear, a part of this issue of movements and publics is if you think movements entirely in terms of their explicit objectives and success or failure, you dramatically underestimate the importance of movements because they almost always fail. Um, and you would think, well, there's nothing there. But in fact, they, the point about recurrence and all this is they have lives beyond whether they succeed or fail in their immediate objectives. And even if they succeed, it often turns out that that's a kind of capture by the state, which internalizes the objectives. And it's, but but the, the course of social change is way bigger than that. And so some modest you know, reforms, some new ideas on the agenda have um, deceptive modesty and produce you know, uh, progeny that go on in all variety of directions. I mean, conversely, if you think publicness entirely in terms of trying to reach settled, reasoned um, conclusions about well-formulated issues, kind of like philosophy department seminars, um, then you greatly impoverish what publicness accomplishes. So the reason I want to bring movements and publicness together is that each concept is prone to getting impoverished by the absence of the other, it seems to me. We need to look at these together. It's not that we should do movements instead of the public sphere or something, but we should figure out how to connect these better in thinking more about both and thinking about the indirect and, um, and often unintended um, ways in which they have implications. Give you, you, you should have the last word. That, so. like that was it. Yeah. That yeah. was it. <laughs> this seems like a good place to pause. Let's thank Craig at our remaining symposiums. Thank you.